once again, want to welcome you to our step-by-step series. And uh, as we journey our way through the Bible, Bible surveying each book of the Bible. And our survey has brought us as far as the book of Deuteronomy. So if you'll open your Bibles up to the book of Deuteronomy this evening, we'll get started in our study. And let's go ahead and pray together. Father, we are thankful for the opportunity to be together, Lord, to worship together, uh, also, Lord, to hear from your word. And Lord, as, as we are seeking to understand the layouts of books and what they're all about, to, to be able to read them better on our own, we certainly don't want to limit you from speaking to our hearts tonight. Lord, we know that there are truths um, in this passage that are so vital to our growth and development in following you. So we just give you license to speak into our life tonight, to work in us, to transform us into your image. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, we are in the book of Deuteronomy this evening, and Deuteronomy is the fifth And it's the fifth book of the Bible, and it's the fifth and final book written by Moses. Um, It completes a a group of books referred to as the Law, the Torah, or the Pentateuch, and all five of these books written by Moses. Um, The book of Deuteronomy has 34 chapters, has just north of 950 verses, um, it can be read in a couple of hours. Um, it, is, it is didactic in nature. It's not narrative. It, it doesn't, you're not following a storyline. You don't have characters and a backdrop and events happening. It is a series of messages that is presented to the people. They're in one location. The purpose of Deuteron- Deuteronomy is to remind the next generation of the Word of God and to call them into a covenant relationship with God. So it's to remind them of what God's Word says and to invite them into relationship with the Lord. You remember that they are the second generation that has come out of Egypt. The first generation has passed away in the wilderness. And so there's this invitation to come to the Lord. If you, Deuteronomy chapter 5 at verse 1 reads this way, And Moses called Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, by the way, that is a repeated concept or phrase within the book. Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. So he's reminding them of the teaching of God's word so they'll learn them and they'll live them. And then he says this, The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. Horeb is the mountain range, uh, um, and Sinai is one of its peaks. So when he refers to Horeb, he's referring to them being camped there in the book of Exodus and receiving the law of God. He says, verse 3, the Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. In other words, he's saying there is a covenant relationship that God wants to have with you. It wasn't just for your fathers, it's a relationship that he wants to have with you. So this book is a call to remembrance of the word of God and an invitation to the generation to enter into covenant relationship with God. And we might recognize, biblically speaking, that that is sort of a, a continual message of the Bible reminding us of the instruction of God's Word and inviting people into relationship with God. And and tonight, you know, we would want to be certain that you know that you can have a relationship with God through putting faith in Jesus Christ. You put your trust in Him, you're invited into a personal relationship with you, the new covenant where the Spirit of God enters you and you're born again and become a child of God. And if that's something that you have yet to do, We'd invite you after the service to come see our prayer team leaders and just say, I want to have a covenant relationship with God. Now, the book, Deuteronomy, its title 
um, is, is a, a, the title Deuteronomy was first given to the book when the Hebrew scriptures, our Old Testament, was translated into Greek. That happened in the, in the third and second century BC, and it was translated from Hebrew to Greek, and the title Deuteronomy was given to this book. The title literally means second law. And this title is, is somewhat appropriate in that Moses is rehearsing the law that has already been given, he's rehearsing it to the next generation. But it's also a somewhat misfortunate title because the book is a whole lot more than just a rehearsing of the law. It's also somewhat misfortunate because the Greek word namas, translated law, is, is similar to our word law. Our word law is, is relatively narrow. It would speak of, of prohibitions, it would speak of rules, it would speak of regulations. And the Greek word namas would be similar to that. <clears throat> but the Hebrew word Torah is a much broader word. The word Torah would speak of regulations and rules and prohibitions, but it would go much broader than that to carry the idea of instruction and even to the, uh, even to the point of saying like a way of life. The, the law, the first five books of the Bible, are not just a list of things you can't do. It's, it's not like the pool rules when you show up at the rec center, okay? So there's the list of things, like all the stuff you can't do are on the list. That's not the, what the, but we often think of it this way. We've got the law, now we've got the second law, all the stuff we're told not to do. Instead, these books are an invitation into a way of life that God is calling His people to. And this way of life is, gonna, is going to make them distinct from the world around them. They are going to be distinct in a host of different ways. And each of these ways are, or many of these ways are unhidden. We might even say unhideable. God's, God's purpose in giving um, these the, this way of life and changing the way of living of individuals is so that we will stand out in the world around us because God's desire is for His people to be a light to the world. That was the purpose of Israel. Israel was designed by God to be a light to the Gentiles. It was supposed to be a beacon shooting out to the whole world of who God is and how to have relationship with Him. That's what it was supposed to be. And that may be part of the reason why God chose the location to give to them as a land, because it was right in the major highway that connected the, the two most populated and influential areas of the world at that time, North Africa with Mesopotamia. And so they were set right in the middle of that. That was God's purpose. And so this idea of Torah is an invitation into the way of life that God wants His people to live so that His people can be distinct from the world around them, so His people can be a light to the world that people can be drawn to Him. The same thing is true of us today. That's the church. We are invited into the way of Christ. Our lives are different. <laughs> Our whole value system is different, and we're designed to stand out and be a light that draws people unto the Lord. Light is compelling, especially when you're in the dark, and it's compelling, it's, it's alluring, and that's God's desire for His people. So this term, Deuteronomy, second law, there's some value in understanding. It's a rehearsal of the law. It's a little bit unfortunate because of our limited understanding of the concept of law. Um, <clears throat> the, this is not the original title of the book. The original title is taken from chapter 1, verse 1. It reads this way. These are the words which Moses spoke. The original title, I don't speak Hebrew. I won't attempt to say it in Hebrew, but it would be a translation or uh, the English translation, these are the words. That was the original title. And this title is a very suitable title for the book 
because the book of Deuteronomy is a collection of sermons that were spoken by Pastor Moses to the second generation just prior to them entering into the promised land. It's a series of messages, and, and, and Moses is seeking to compel the people um, to love God and to follow God. And so the book is a series of messages, one after another, inviting people into the way of life that God has called them to, inviting them to love God, and inviting them to follow God. Now, some of these messages are, are particularly compelling. Let me share a few verses with you. Chapter 28, verse 1, Moses says, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully His commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Let me ask you, is that, a, is that compelling? Is that something you'd like, wait a minute, high above? That's just better, right? Okay, that's just, <clears throat> I want to be, high, like I want to be this idea of exalted in my life, being what God intended for it to be. He says, well, listen, if you follow the ways of God, God's going to do this in your life. Listen to chapter 29 at verse 9. Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. Isn't that our hope? That what we do would be prosperous? Like, I want to prosper in my family. I want to prosper in my way of life. I want to prosper in, in, the, in the calling that's on my life. He says, well, listen, walk in my ways and do them. In chapter 30 at verse 19, he says this, I call heaven and earth as witness today against you. I have set before you, this is towards the end of the book, Moses is, is it's one of his final messages, I've called heaven and earth as witness against you, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live. That's compelling, isn't it? Message after message, inviting people into the way of life. One of, the, one of my favorites is this one, Deuteronomy 28. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Now, that's figurative language. It's become super famous figurative language among certain circles within the church. But just, I mean, all I can picture is I picture the school play and I picture the donkey and two people have to play the donkey. I don't want to be the tail. Okay, that's how I picture it. That's what my mind sees. But just saying, listen, I'm going to make you the head and not the tail. It's this idea of God inviting them into a way of life. Now, <clears throat> the date of this book, when it was written and the time period that it covers, it's at the end of the wilderness journey. It's the, we remember that the book of, um, well, the book of Genesis covered about 100 years in the history of Israel. We met Abraham, we met his son Isaac, we met his son Jacob, we met his 12 sons, and we watched as the family moved from Canaan down to Egypt. Then we went dark for 400 years. In that 400 years, the family grew extensively, and they transitioned from a position of honor in Egypt to a position of slavery. When the book of Exodus began, um, uh, it begins with the birth of Moses. It covers a period of about 82 years, although most of it is the final two of those 82 years, as Israel is delivered from Egypt, and they make their way through the Red Sea and out to Mount Sinai, where they camp, <clears throat> and they remain there for a year. The book of Leviticus begins, it covers one month, and it's a series of messages or instruction given to the people predominantly that they would learn how to appropriately worship God and live for God. Then the book of Numbers begins, and it begins with them now starting to make motion again. They leave Sinai, and they march their way to Kadesh Barnea. It's an 11-day journey. It takes them well over a month to get there, a couple of months actually to get there because of some struggles they have along the way. And then they are invited into the land of promise to take the land 
and because of fear, and particularly because of the fear of how it might affect their families, they do not enter in. And so as a result, they wander around in the wilderness for a period of 38 years. At the end of those 38 years, <clears throat> they come now to the area, or they begin to, to travel north up, and they're going through the areas of, of Edom and Moab and, and Ammon. They're working their way up. And they're told specifically not to engage in battle with the Edomites, the Moabites, or the Ammonites, because that land was not given to them they were going to be given specifically the land of Canaan. But we read about two kings, Sihon and Og, who led their troops and attacked Israel, and God strengthened Israel, and they defeated them. And so now they've come, and they've camped here in Moab, across from Israel, across the Jordan, and they park there. The book of Deuteronomy will cover a period of roughly 40 days. In chapter 1, we're told in verse 3, and take a look if you're there, verse 3 of chapter 1 says that uh, it came to pass in the 40th year in the 11th month on the first day. So the first day of the 11th month of the 40th year, this book starts. We're told that they enter in to the promised land on the, what is it, the 10th day of the first month in the 41st year. So we've got the whole 11th month, the whole 12 months, and 10 days of the first month of the next year. But 30 of those days, trust me, we're going somewhere, 30 of those days is morning after the passing of Moses. So what's left is a 40-day period. So for 40 days, um, verse 1, take a look, Deuteronomy 1. These are the words which Moses spoke to Israel on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain opposite, and he lists a bunch of places. Down in verse 5, on this side of Jordan in the land of Moses, or in the land of Moab, Moses began to explain the law. So what we have is that we have them camped there. I want to sort of attempt to draw a picture for you of that scene. Um, today, it, it, well, basically, um, this area, this plains of Moab, sit on the east side of the Jordan River, just below the Jordan, Jordanian mountains. Across the Jordan River, you have, a, you have the plain continues until you hit the southern, or the eastern side of the Judean mountains. That's where Jericho sits. So today, you could travel to Jericho. You can go and there's a cable car that you can take and you can go up to the side of that mountain. It's referred to as the Mount of Temptation because somewhere in that wilderness is where Jesus went out and was tempted for 40 days. We don't know that it was exactly on that location, but we also don't know that it wasn't exactly at that location. So you can go up on this mountain, and if you were on that mountain, you would be looking east, and you'd be looking across, across a long, flat plateau. You'd see the Jordan River winding through it, and you'd see the plateau continue until you saw the west side of the mountains of Jordan. In that plain, on the other side of the Jordan, is where Israel was camped. Now, we know from the book of Numbers exactly how they were camped. We know that in the center of the camp was what? The tabernacle. And we know that there were three tribes that were camped north and three tribes on the east and three tribes in the south and three tribes in the west camped all around. And so if you were up on that hill and you would look and you would see the tribes camped there around the tabernacle. And you could wake up early in the morning and you'd watch and you'd see activity happening first around the tabernacle because every morning the Levites would bring an animal, the priests would put it on the altar and they would sacrifice it to the Lord. So every single morning while they camped there, they would begin offering a burnt offering to the Lord. You would also notice people walking out of their tents. 
And they were walking out and they were picking breakfast up off of the ground. Okay, apparently there was a much more than a 15 second rule. So they would go out, they'd pick their manna up and they would bring, and they'd be, begin to prepare their manna into whatever they thought it tastes best as, right? So you know, you know there were super creative people in the group, right? You know, there's the guy like me who just goes, just eats whatever's there. And then there's that guy, right? And you're looking over and you're going, oh my gosh, I didn't know you could do that with manna. That's insane. I want to eat at his house every day, right? But they're preparing their meals, right? They're enjoying their food. You're watching this happen. And then at some point during the day, they congregate together and Pastor Moses comes out and Pastor Moses begins to instruct them from the Word. This happens for 40 days. The people in Jericho are watching it happen. I'm, that, the surroundings there, guaranteed, the people of Jericho had guys up on the mountaintops as watchmen just looking out. What are these lunatics doing now? Same thing they did yesterday. They're cooking an animal, they're eating weird food off the ground, and they're listening to some guy teach. <laughs> Okay, every day, 40 days, this goes on. So the, uh, this lays out for us. Now, the, the, this book is very important. Um, it's important for several reasons. Number one, um, it's important because it's designed to prepare the next generation to, to love and follow God. There's an interesting thing that developed with the, with the second generation of the church of Jesus Christ. See, the first generation of the church was predominantly made up of people who had been converted from entirely different belief systems. And so they had radical conversion stories. Like, I, I used to worship idols, I heard the gospel, I gave my life to Jesus, and every aspect of my life changed. Every part of it changed. My entire value system was completely broken and God had to rewire me with his word. But then this person that got saved out of paganism and this person that got saved out of some other form of paganism or whatever, and they get married. They both love Jesus. And then they have children. And now they're raising children and these children are not gonna have these dramatic conversion stories. These children are going to be raised in the things of the Lord. This book is illustrating to us how that works. It's so important because Moses is now speaking to the second generation. These guys all grew up with the law. They grew up, they, like some of them were children when the mountain shook and Moses walked up and came down glowing in the daytime. Like they were alive during that and they, they saw these things. They woke up to the sacrifices every morning. They woke up to the Sabbath observances. They woke up to the dietary laws. They, they lived it. And now Moses is standing before this second generation and he's instructing them about how they can have a covenant relationship with God and they can walk in the ways of God. So it's a very important book. Secondly, it's, it's very important to the rest of the Bible. The book of Deuteronomy is the most quoted book of the Old Testament in the New Testament. So, so the New Testament authors, their number one place of information to pull from in their writings was the book of Deuteronomy. They, they, for them in formulating what it meant to follow Jesus and live for him, they saw the information recorded by Pastor Moses in the book of Deuteronomy as essential for us. Some of the more famous passages quoted, you remember when Jesus is facing the devil and, the, and he's being tempted, he hasn't eaten for 40 days, and the devil says, what you should do is turn this stone into bread, right? And Jesus responds to him. What does he say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, Jesus is God. He could have made that verse up right then and there. Could have been a brand new Bible verse, but it wasn't. It's a quote from Deuteronomy. Then the devil says, hey, I want to take you up on here. You can jump off here and the angels will protect you. And what does he say? Don't tempt the Lord your God. Again, he could make up Bible verses, but he didn't. That's a quotation from the book of Deuteronomy. Um, when Paul 
It's talking about that, that wonderful passage that, that helps to sort of codify, codify? codify the simplicity of, of receiving Christ. He says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. He's just telling us like the simplicity of entry point into relationship with God. But as Paul leads up to that passage, he, he's talking about how, listen, don't think that this is something that's super far away from you. This is something that is so close. He's, he's, he's saying kind of this idea that heaven has come down to us and it's so close. It's right there on the, on the tip of your tongue. It's so close to you that if you confess with your mouth, he's quoting directly from the book of Deuteronomy. But most famously is in Mark chapter 12. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus was asked, what is the greatest of all the commandments? And Jesus answered, first, the first of all commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. This is the first commandment. That's a direct quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And listen, that message, Deuteronomy chapter 6, guess what message Deuteronomy chapter 6 follows? Guess what message Deuteronomy chapter 6 follows? Deuteronomy chapter 5. Well done, class. Deuteronomy chapter 5 is a rehearsal of the Ten Commandments. Moses gives a message. He reminds them of the Ten Commandments written on these tablets of stone. And then in chapter 6, he quote, he states, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus says, hey, of these commandments, which one's the most important? Love God. In fact, um, he would add a second taken from Leviticus that we're to love our neighbor. And Paul would tell us that the entirety of Scripture hangs upon those two things. If you can't figure out a Bible verse, you don't know what it means, just fall back on this. It means I should love God and love others. I don't know what this verse means. It's so confusing. Well, just fall back on love God and love others. You're probably doing okay since the entirety of the Bible hangs on that. Okay, you can move, you can move past it. In fact, if you're taking a test and I'm the teacher and you write that, I'll give you credit. All right, let's, let's kind of walk through. So, so we've seen the, the, the name We've seen the setting and date. We've seen the importance of this book. I want to talk a little bit tonight just kind of about how the book lays out, kind of an outline of the book. As I mentioned before, the book has 34 chapters. The book is not narrative. In other words, it, it doesn't tell stories, so you can't divide it based upon location or based upon interactions. The book is didactic. In other words, it's, it's teaching. It's instructive. And so the book can be divided based upon the content of the message. And it seems that we could divide the book somewhat naturally into three smaller parts. Part one, or section one, would be chapters one through four. And chapters one through four would be a reviewing of their journeys. What, what's happening is Moses is reflecting on what has happened. And he takes the people, remember he's with the second generation, and he takes them back. He says, now remember, God brought us out of Egypt. And God brought us through the Red Sea. And God brought us to Sinai. And we received the law. And, and then God brought us to Kadesh. And we rebelled against God. And then God brought us again now to the border of the Promised Land. And we fought against Sihon. And we fought against Og. And then we distributed the land among Reuben, Gad, and half Manasseh. And here we are camped today. So that takes us through the first four chapters of the book. It's just a rehearsal of the things that have happened there. The second part of the book is kind of the bulk of the book, and that would be uh, chapters 5 through 26. And this is the, the part of the book that is a restating of the law, and it's, it's more of a focus on the present. Moses is speaking to this present congregation. He's not speaking to their fathers and he's not speaking to their great-grandchildren that haven't been born yet. He's speaking to them, and he's rehearsing for them the law. He's, he's talking to them about the purpose of the law. 
is to compel them to love God and follow God. In fact, an interesting sort of anecdote within the book of Deuteronomy is the use of the word love. I, I think the word love is found 18 times in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, if there's 950 verses and there's 18 references to love, you think, that doesn't seem like a whole lot unless you recognize that from Genesis through Numbers, the word love has only appeared eight times. And of those eight times, only one reference to the love of God. One reference to the love of God in the first four books of the Bible, 18 references, and it's all wrapped up in God's love for humanity and how He desires a love relationship with humanity. You see, the love of God that's presented in Scripture, it's not presented simply as a one-way street. It's not just God loves us. That is part of the message of Scripture. But it goes beyond that to God wants a love relationship with us. God wants an exchange of love between Himself and, and people, between Himself and yourself. That's the, and so the, these messages are presented, even though it's a restating of the law, the first part in particular, Moses is inviting the people into a love relationship with God. It's, uh, it's, as a result, in these chapters, there are some very compelling sermons. In fact, chapters 5 through 13 are very compelling messages by Moses. You know, there's a, I have books on my shelf that are the podcasts of the day of pastors from the Victorian era in England. And, you know, one of the beauties about that time period in history is there weren't a lot of other things to entertain people. And so literature was very verbose and communicators did the same way. They would paint pictures. And so, so a lot of the pastors that spoke at that time, they were, you know, they were wordsmiths. And you read their sermons and they're just like so amazing. There's one, one pastor by the name of Charles Spurgeon. And this guy is like, it's just like, if that's what you have to do to be a pastor, I can't do that. <laughs> like it's just so amazingly poetic and picturesque the way he does things. And, and it's, it's enjoyable just to read these messages. And in, in the chapters 5 through 13 of the book of Deuteronomy, you're going to find messages like that. Moses is compelling the people to follow the Lord. In, ver in chapters 14 through 26 is more of the rehearsal of the law. He, he talks to them in that section. He talks to them about their, the difference in their life. He, he talks about how they view death should be different than it was before they, they knew the Lord, about their diet should be different, about how, what they do with their, with their finances, how they view values and, and how they treat the poor and, and what they do with their calendar year is, would look different for them and, and who ruled over them and how they were to rule and, and, and what happened when a person had committed a crime and how to address those things. All of this stuff just creating a people that would live differently than the world around them. Now, the last section of the book, chapters 27 through 30, are a warning to the people. And this is sort of like a look into the future. So the first five, four chapters, he's standing before the people, he's saying, look, guys, remember how we got here? Chapters 5 through 26 He's speaking to the people and he's saying, this is how God would have you to live. And he's pouring his whole heart into exhorting them to live that way. And then chapters 27 to the end, he's going to warn the people, listen, when you get into the land, there are things that you need to be aware of. There are dangers that you, that you are going to face. Now, this final section might divide into four parts. Number one, there's a compelling message to encourage obedience. If you have your Bible in front of you, go ahead and turn it to chapter 27. Deuteronomy chapter 27. This is one of the most vivid illustrations in Scripture. In chapter 27, we're told, verse 1, 
Now Moses, with the elders of Israel, commanded the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you today, and it shall be on the day when you cross over the Jordan to the land which the Lord is giving you, that you shall set up for yourself large stones and whitewash them with lime and write on them all the words of this law. So as soon as you get over, the first thing you're going to do is you are going to get these stones and whitewash them and write the word of God upon these stones. This is something, again, it's illustrating this is going to be the foundation of your nation. The, I don't, I, I'm, I'm sure I'd heard this before, but it kind of struck me on our last trip when we were in Israel and we went into uh, the, the museum and we were looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls. And <clears throat> Israel uh, became a nation in 1948. And at that same time was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the, and the, the curator there, he says, God gave us a nation, and God gave us back his word. And it was just like, oh my gosh. Like, whether you realize that and you're living it or not, that's up to you. But that's striking, isn't it? Hey, that, that foundation. You know, I, when we first moved into the building next door, and we were remodeling that, and we invited uh, the, the church, anybody that wants to come and just write a Bible verse on the, on the ground of the, before we lay the carpet, and so there's all these Bible verses written all over the foundation. One of the young guys here just did that at their house, you know, before they laid some new floor, just write all these Bible verses. Now, listen, having rocks with Bible verses on it is not going to make you walk with God, is it? It's a symbol of the foundation of life. God wants them to understand, my word is the foundation of your life. Write this on the stones. But they didn't stop there. In verse uh, 7, he says, you're going to do these, I'm sorry, verse 8, and you shall write very plainly on the stones all the words of the law. So not only do you write them, but he's basically what he's saying is, I don't want Jim doing any of the writing, okay? I can't even read my own writing, okay? Some of you may be like that, like, I, like I'll write notes. I, this week as I was prepping for, for this message and I'm, I had this little notebook and I was writing all these notes in it and then I opened it up and I was like, this is not, these are not even words. I don't know what I was thinking, okay? So he's saying, I want it to be written in such a way that everyone can read it. It's, it's so important. My word is, is not written to be confused. It's written to be plainly presented. Now, this chapter is going to go on. We won't read all of it, but here's what they're to do once they have these stones. There were these two hills. One was called Mount Gerizim. The other one was called Mount Ebal. And they were to, when they entered into the land, and we'll read about it happening in the book of Joshua, once they conquer and have some peace, they, they, they put six of the tribal leaders up on one mountain and six of the tribal leaders up on the other mountain. They have those whitewashed stones with the word of God written clearly on it. And from one mountain, the, the leaders read all of the curses that will come onto your life if you disobey the Word of God. Now, when we think of curses, we, we kind of think of them like some sort of like voodoo thing where somebody's projecting something on you, you know, like, may the fleas of a thousand camels invest your gym shorts, you know? And so it's like, oh, no, you know, okay. That's not how the Bible uses the word curse. The Bible uses the word curse, meaning simply these are the consequences of a life that lives outside the boundaries of God's word. And so they read like, this is what's going to happen. And he, they describe, listen, your enemies are going to defeat you. And the land is not going to provide for you. And, you're, and, and, and all sorts of chaos and social unrest are going to happen within the nation if you don't follow God's way. And the people stand in the valley between these two hills, and they just say, every time there's a, a pronouncement of something that's going to happen to them if they disobey the word, the people stand in the middle and they go, amen, amen, we know that's going to happen. And then from the other mountain, they, they call out all the blessings. They say, here's what your life's going to be like if you follow God. These are the things that God's going to do for you. Begin to list these tremendous blessings that God wants to pour out upon their life. So, so Moses says, listen, when you get into the land, this is what you need to do. You need to make a distinction between what your life is going to be like if you walk in the ways of God 
and if you walk outside the ways of God. The second thing that happens in these closing chapters is there's a strong warning against the danger of disobedience. Chapter 28 at verse 49 reads this way, if they disobey, the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the ends of the earth, as swift as an eagle flies, a nation whose language you don't understand. He goes on to say in the 52nd verse, they shall besiege you at all your gates until your high and fortified walls which you trust come down through all your land, and they shall besiege you at your gates throughout your land which the Lord your God has given you. He goes on to talk about how you will then be taken captive to this other land and you will become their servants. Moses is speaking at about 1400 BC. When we follow the storyline of the Bible, those of you in our men's study, those of you in our women's Bible study, you've just gone through the book of Daniel. What's the storyline of the book of Daniel? Daniel begins with what happening? Babylon, a nation far away, swift as an eagle, comes against Israel, besieges the cities. We, we only read about the siege of Jerusalem, but that had happened in all the major cities throughout the land, and they conquered the and they took the people back captive. He says, if you disobey God. Now, one of the primary areas of disobedience was idolatry. And there's constant warnings throughout the book of Deuteronomy against idolatry. And then the idea of idolatry where, you know, where God says not to make an image to represent him and not to make an image that would represent some other thing that you would worship as God. So two things are presented there. Number one is the idea that we can't alter God to shape him into what we think he should be like. That God says, no, you, you're not allowed to do that. This is who I am. I will alter you. See, what, what happens, we come in, when, we're re, when we read our Bibles or we are hearing scripture taught, what happens is we come face to face with who God is and what he wants and us. And, and God's saying, never am I going to change. You go, oh, I'm sorry. I never thought of it that way. You're right. I should not be like that, okay? But there are plenty of times where God's word will say to you, that's not okay. It's not okay for you to live like that. And that's that wrestling match that we have because we are good at living that way. We like it. We enjoy it. And so God says, you can't alter me. And then secondly, God says, and you can't go pick some other thing to worship because you don't like me. That's not okay. And, and idolatry is, is something that is very degrading. When a person begins to worship something other than God, that person, instead of elevating into what God has created man to be like, because that's the process that you're in, the sanctification process that you're in is an elevating process. God is raising you from a, from a fallen creature living independently of Him to the person that he's designed you to be. It's this elevating work that God is doing. Idolatry is degrading, and we become like that which we worship. And so this, this idolatry poisoned the nation, and as a result, they fell just as Moses warned them that they would. Um, the other two parts of the closing section of Deuteronomy are the introduction of Joshua as Israel's new leader, and then finally, the, the passing of Moses. Moses dies at the end of the book. Two last things, and we'll let you go. A couple of highlights in this book. Highlights from Moses' messages. One highlight is this, and that is that um, God considered Israel as a very special people. Listen to what he says in, in chapter 7, verse 6. He says, you're a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples of the face of the earth. Did God think highly of his people? Like you're a special people. You're a chosen people, right? He thought very highly of them. Now, he goes on to explain that he has a tremendous love for them. In verse 7 of the same chapter, it says, the Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people for you were what? <laughs> That's super humbling. It says, God says, I love you so much. You go, 
Why? Well, well, really, not much about you. He, says, he goes on to say, but because the Lord loves you and because he'd keep the oath that he swore. He's saying the same thing John said in 1 John 4 where he says, God is love. God's saying, you're a special people and you're special not because of your behavior, but you're special because I love you and I've brought you into a covenant relationship with myself. Now, as a special people, Moses is going to speak certain things to them. He's going to speak to them of their need to remember what God has done in their life. And remember is a word that's oft repeated and it's, co- it's contrasting word forget is used often. Um, I think the word remember is used 16 times. The word forget is used 14 times. And then terms like take heed, be careful, beware, watch, those are used over 70 times. So it's this idea to recall the things that we have learned. He's he's calling people to remember certain things. And if they're going to remember, they're going to first have to listen. So words like listen and hear are used often in the book of Daniel. I'm sorry, the book of Deuteronomy. Um, They're told to listen to his statutes. They're told to hear his statutes. They're told told to to hear what God has done for them. There's also a reoccurring warning in the book of what not to listen to. They're told not to listen to false prophets. They're told not to listen to the unbelieving world around them. And then in a striking passage, this is Deuteronomy 29, 19. Deuteronomy 29, 19 reads this way. And so it may not happen when a person hears the words of this curse. This is the stuff that's going to happen to you if you don't obey God that he blesses himself in his heart saying, quote, I will have peace even though I follow the dictates of my own heart. And then Moses says, as though a drunkard could be included with the sober. Hey, he's saying, listen, he's saying, a person should not li- ever listen to the dictates of their own heart. We live in a, in a world that that's sort of the mantra, isn't it? Follow your heart. Now, I've had, I've had highly educated people, people who are educated in the social sciences, particularly in psychology, tell me, give me advice, say, follow your heart. That's not good advice. Your heart, the way we use it, speaks of your emotions. Essentially, to tell somebody to follow their hearts is to tell someone to follow their emotions. Are your emotions stable? (laughs) If you think they are, ask the person that's closest to you. And if they're not afraid of you because your emotions are so unstable, they'll tell you the truth. We don't follow our hearts. We need to follow the dictates of God's word. So as a result, Moses calls them, listen, you need to listen to the word. You need to, he goes on, observe the word, learn it. And then he tells them this, you need to teach it. You need to teach it. Listen to this. This will kind of be the closing thought, but the... The term children, or, it's, or variations of that, is used over 100 times in this book. The term father, variations of that, used over 70 times. Th- those are important concepts to this book, aren't they? This idea of one generation instructing the next generation. One last place we'll turn in our, in our text, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6, starting at verse 4. It reads this way, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. We've heard that before, haven't we? It's an important verse in the Bible. Is it the most important verse in the Bible? Jesus thought it was, right? So very important. Then he says this, listen, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You need to know them. And you shall do what with them? Teach them diligently to whom? Your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, walk by the way, lie down and rise up. You'll bind them on your hand and on the front lip between your eyes. You're going to write them on the doorpost of your house and on the city gates. He's saying this truth, listen, the truth that God loves you and that God wants a love relationship with you is something that we need to fully grasp and it's something that we need to instruct our children in. The next generation needs to learn that they can have a love relationship with God, especially in light of the fact that these guys, this second generation doesn't come out of slavery. 
They don't have the radical conversion experience with the blood of the lamb and the sea parting, right? These guys are going to have a relationship with God based upon knowing his word and understanding a love relationship with him. The book of Deuteronomy, I always want to kind of end with this. Um, Jesus is found in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, there's a verse that promises a prophet like unto Moses. And when Jesus came on the scene, they recognized him to be the prophet Moses spoke about. So he's the fulfillment of that prophecy. And then there's an also an interesting little verse in the book of Deuteronomy that talks about if someone hangs on a tree, um, they've committed a crime worthy of death, they hang on a tree, don't leave them overnight, and it ends saying, cursed is the one that hangs on a tree. Paul takes that verse and alludes to sort of the shame that Jesus experienced upon the cross. He says Jesus is the one that was cursed by hanging upon a tree. And so even a little nugget tucked away pointing to the cross of Christ.